Hi everyone and welcome to Build Your AutoCAD IQ. My name is Ashley and today we have a really special presentation for Mac users. Tips and tricks for AutoCAD for Mac 2016. Um, today with me presenting will be Jim LaPierre. I'll be moderating and we also have Dave and Nauman, our AutoCAD expert elite with us well to help answer some of your questions. So a little bit about us, Jim LaPierre, our presenter, is an Autodesk expert elite. He's based out of Maryland. Dave is a technical support specialist based out of our Manchester office. Nauman is our Autodesk expert elite based out of Ohio. And I am a technical support specialist in Boston. So before we get started, we just have a couple of quick polls for you. And the first one is, is this your first Autodesk help webinar? And we'll give you, <laughs> that was very easy. <laughs> looks like everyone's answered already. So the, um, looks like about 90% of you, this is not your first um, help webinar for about 9% of you, this is. So we'll close that and share it. And our second poll is, which AutoCAD-based application do you use? And it looks like we have a nice mix here. Around 35% of you are using AutoCAD 29% LT, 17% AutoCAD Architecture, MEP, and other verticals. And I'll go ahead and share the results here with you. So before we get started, please feel free to leave questions in the chat window and we'll answer them as best we can. We have Dave and Nauman with us doing that. This session will be recorded and links are available in the registration reminder, the post-webinar survey, as well as in the chat window. Um, so we have one more webinar for uh, AutoCAD. Um, for the 2016, and that's on December 15th, and it's the third dimension, solid editing tips and tricks in AutoCAD 2017, and then happy holidays. Um, you can watch past webinars at any time on YouTube, and if you'd like to download the data sets from Box, you can always follow along and do that. Uh, we have our Autodesk Knowledge Network. We have a ton of resources here for both AutoCAD and AutoCAD LT. And this week's agenda includes the AutoCAD for Mac 2017. So Jim will cover a brief history, the differences in Mac and PC, the interface and new features, as well as some really great tips and tricks. So Jim, at this point, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. I think I've got it. Um, so really quickly about me, i got a, hopefully a lot to cover, so a lot of stuff, but um, I've been using AutoCAD for going on about 18 years now, since version 13. Um, I've worked in pretty much anything that has to do with getting black lines on white paper, so electromechanical engineering, architectural design, telecommunications, uh, and CAD management. Um, I am an AutoCAD uh, certified expert and expert elite member, proud and humbled to be that. Um, I own Impact Design, so essentially I'm a hired gun uh, CAD manager and IT manager for some architectural firms across the country. I also teach AutoCAD uh, part-time at a local community college, and I am an author on lynda.com. And I am a former genius uh, at Apple retail stores, so I've, uh, as I say, I've been uh, drunk the Kool-Aid, been fitted for the pajamas, and I'm quite the, uh, the Apple fanboy. So uh, I'm going to run through the history of this just really quickly. Um, hopefully some of you are aware of this. So back in 1994, Autodesk left the Apple Mac platform uh, kind of with everybody else. Um, it was a kind of dark days for Apple. Um, and for about uh, 11 years, there really wasn't any way of running AutoCAD on a, uh, on a Mac computer. And then in 2005, Intel processors came back over to the Mac, um, and that allowed us to actually run Windows in the Mac environment actually dual boot or install Windows as a secondary operating system. Uh, Apple realized that this was going to be rather popular, so they actually came out with a software and application called Boot Camp that said, hey, you want to run Windows on your Apple computer? Fine, we'll give you a hand. 
and they actually made the process rather easy. Um, but for five years after that, we really only had two options for running AutoCAD. We could either dual boot or you know, run two operating systems, restart into one, restart in the other, uh, or what's called virtualization. And then in 2010, Autodesk announced AutoCAD for Mac, so the first Mac native AutoCAD release in 17 years. Uh, it was rewritten from the ground up. It wasn't just a port or anything like that. And this is kind of what we left with. So this was the last version of AutoCAD to run on the Mac uh, back in 1992. So again, uh, when Intel processors came back, they came up with this uh, cool little software, Bootcamp Assistant. Essentially, it was, you know, hey, you want to run Windows? That's great. Give me the Windows disk. How much space do you want to give it? And then it would kind of take it from there. Uh, it made it rather easy. Um, and it was convenient, but you still had, you know, you were carving up your hard drive a little bit. You either had, you know, two operating systems, one versus the other, um, or you could do virtualization, which was for, you know, an average user was a little complicated running two operating systems at the same time. Uh, it also kind of split your system resources, so neither the Mac nor the Windows side really ran up to their full potential. So, again, in 2010, they released AutoCAD for Mac. So um, obviously, very very different interface. A um, lot of uh, lot of differences between the Windows version. Now, unfortunately, in the very initial release, there were a lot of what we'll call missing features. Um, you couldn't edit plot styles. There were no sheet set manager. Couldn't uh, use layer states. Uh, couldn't create or edit uh, dynamic blocks. So it was a very limited uh, release to start things off with. Um, and I think, unfortunately, they kind of had this you know stigma of that. That's you know. The, AutoCAD for Mac is always missing features. I can tell you that in the last, you know, six years, five releases, um, that they have come leaps and bounds. So in 2012, they added AutoCAD for Mac LT, uh, available in the App Store. They added a bunch of XREF improvements, network licensing. Uh, we could finally edit plot styles um, and a lot of layer tools. 2013, we got the Project Manager, which is support for sheet sets, uh, PDF underlays, path arrays. 2014 was a big year. We got Retina support for high-res uh, screens. We got eTransmit, and we got Autodesk 360 support for syncing your files. 2015, we finally got dynamic block editing. We got support for layer states, data linking. We got quick select. And in 2016, we got XREF path mapping. This is kind of a big feature. This is one of the newer features. It allows uh, people who work in a mixed office. So if you've got a Mac and somebody else in your office has a Windows computer, you know that the uh, if you're using full path for your external references, they have different paths to get to the same server. Windows uses drive letters. Mac uses what are called volumes. With XREF path mapping, pretty much said that, okay, I'm going to equate my Windows path with my Mac path. And that meant that both of you could be working in the same external references and the same files without having to constantly relocate your external references. Uh, we got a bunch of Express tools in 2016 as well. Uh, we got the DIM tool, um, and we got the BrevCloud improvements. And these aren't exhaustive lists. These are just kind of the big bullet points uh, over the past few releases. So each release has added functionality from the Windows side, uh, kind of trying to keep up, but they've also added new features that are released on Windows. Uh, so every year when we get new features on the Windows side, we tend to get those on the Mac side following that as well. So again, like the DIM tool, uh, the master DIM tool, we got that in the next version right after the Windows version got it. And I could say that after you know five or six years, 90% of the users that I really run into, it now does everything that they need it to do. Um, Again, in the beginning, you know, oh, I, I needed to do sheet sets, right? I use layer states, so I can't use AutoCAD for Mac. Well, there are, people are running out of excuses. There really aren't that many features that AutoCAD for Mac doesn't have that people need, actually really use. Um, now, a couple of years back when they, uh, you know, had, when they came out with AutoCAD for Mac, they were, uh, on their website, they had, it was called classes of missing features, and it broke down to three different classes. So some features they were working on. They have, you know, great team uh, of engineers and, and programmers and such, but obviously there's a time limit, you know, things, uh, things take time. Um, but they were working on you know, some of the bigger features. Then there were things that they just weren't working on due to lack of interest. They might get to them down the road, but, you know, not everybody was really clamoring for certain things, so they haven't been working on them. And then there are uh, limits to the operating system itself. So things like .NET and VBA, those are Windows based, you know, systems, so they're just not going to work in the Mac environment. So there are some limitations based on that. But all that said, we do have a lot of uh, features 
that the uh, Windows side doesn't have. Now there's a little bit of translating to be said. So uh, on the Mac side, for you know, we have what's called the project manager instead of the sheet set manager, but works with Windows sheet sets the same way. You can uh, add them, create them, plot them, and so forth. Uh, for tool palettes in the Design Center, we actually have what's called the Content Palette. It's not quite as robust as Design Center, but it works in a similar fashion as uh, kind of tool palettes being able to index your blocks. Um, E-Transmit, which I think is a very, very uh, 90s uh, term, um, we renamed it as Package Drawing. So it does the same functionality, bundles up uh, all your external references and your fonts and your uh, plot styles and everything like that into a nice zip file that you can send off and share with somebody. But again, we also have some things that the Windows version doesn't have. So we have a cool feature that I'll show you guys in a few minutes called Show Palettes as Icons. Uh, we also have Cover Flow and Quick Look, which the Windows version hasn't had. We also have a customizable properties palette, which I'll show you guys again in just a few minutes. And we were also the first ones to come out with Retina support. So the latest version of AutoCAD for Windows 2017, um, they're about, I think, 60, maybe 80% uh, you know, 4K friendly or high res friendly. Well, it really started on the Mac side. We've had that for about three or four years now. If you're not familiar with the term retina, essentially, you know, got Steve Jobs up there explaining it was at a normal viewing distance, the human eye can't see, uh, distinguish the pixels. If they can't, then it's considered a retina class display. So our, all of our uh, interface is quite, um, uh, Quite smooth. Everything obviously looks a lot better when you're on your 4K iMac or your 5K iMac. And it's not just the interface, it's the drawings as well. So all your drawings are going to look a lot crisper, a lot cleaner when you have those 4K displays. So let's actually see some of this stuff in AutoCAD. So this is the uh, AutoCAD for Mac interface, again, coming from Windows. I know it's a little jarring. Um, I think I was told at one point that it was made to be comfortable for Mac users. Unfortunately, it's not very comfortable for Windows users. But it's not that bad. And once you kind of you know, navigate your way around it a little bit, uh, it's a little bit more obvious. So uh, the big factors we have across the top, we've still got the menu bar that we've had for years and years and years. The Windows version hides it by default, but it's still there. We still have all of our normal you know, file, edit, view, uh, we have our tools, um, all of our draw commands are here and so forth. So if you're not familiar with the ribbon or you know you prefer the menu bar, it's still right up top. Uh, and the other, uh, aside from the drawing space, the other most important factor I find is the command line. And we still have the same command line that we have from the Windows version. I can still enter all of my commands down here um, and you know draw all my basic shapes just like I'm used to. So nothing overly different there aside from, again, the jarring interface. And one thing we don't have um, is the ribbon. So we don't, don't have the ribbon kind of up here across the top of the screen. We use what are called tool sets over here on the left side of the screen. It's a little bit different, obviously, than the ribbon. And I hear a lot of people, oh, you know, I need the ribbon. I, you know, I miss the ribbon, um, which I find rather funny, only because I know when, I remember when the ribbon was released, everybody was like, oh, this is horrible. And they'd go back to AutoCAD Classic Workspace, and they, they hated the ribbon. And now everybody, you know, really, really loves it. Um, so we don't have the ribbon, and um, I actually kind of like this setup, um, and it's a personal preference, and I realize not everybody's going to like it, but uh, my reasoning is, um, you know, 10 years ago, everybody started going to these widescreen displays, this wide format display, uh, which means that you lose a lot of your vertical drawing space, and it's fine, it's great, you know, we have a lot of extra room, but, you know, you're still losing a lot of that vertical space, and the ribbon just kind of compounds that you're at, you know, losing even more of your vertical space. So I like the fact that I can keep this stuff on the left and the right side of my screen and take up some of that horizontal space and get as much of the vertical space as I really can. But again, I realize that it's not going to satisfy everybody, but um, again, what we have here are the tool sets. So we've got these broken up into three different tool sets. Drafting, we have a separate one just for annotation, and then we have one just for all of our modeling tools. Um, and theirs are kind of laid out a little bit like the ribbon, so you have kind of clusters here or panels uh, of different tools, and these panels do expand out uh, to show more tools, and I can even lock these panels if there are some tools here that I'm going to be using quite a bit, or I can unlock it, and it'll uh, kind of collapse and get out of my way. Now, over on the right side, we have a uh, properties inspector, again, very similar to the properties palette on the window side, and we also have the layers palette. And just like the regular uh, palettes, these are uh, you know, 
customizable. I can move these around the screen, put them wherever I like. The interesting thing about the palettes is they also do lock into the sides of the screen. So I'm going to drag this over to the right edge of my screen, and you may or may not be able to pick this up, but the right edge of my screen from top to bottom kind of highlights blue. And this lets me know that it's going to dock or lock into that right side of the screen. Be able to see that a little bit more clearly when I do the layers uh, palette here. So I'm just going to drag it over, and if you look right at the top, right where it says Properties Inspector, you can see that little blue highlighted uh, section there. That lets me know that it's going to get docked or locked up there. When I let it go, it hops up there and it locks itself into place. Now the nice thing about these locking themselves together or docking is that they become reactive to one another. So I've got my Show Layer List uh, icon right here. If I click that, there is um, you, know, you can see all my layers, but also the Properties Inspector kind of shrinks itself down just a little bit uh, to give myself a little bit more room up here. If I hide my layer list, Properties Inspector expands to take up all that extra space. So again, they're reactive, so it makes life a little bit easier. And there are other palettes that you can grab uh, that are up here on the windows, uh, or on the window menu bar. So I've got you know, my content, I've got Reference Manager that can pop up over here. Um, and again, all these can be drug around and locked into anywhere on the screen that I want, or I can close them out. So again, all the main elements are there. We've got the status bar down here in the lower right corner where I can see you know, my uh, ortho mode and all my other settings and such. Um, so all the big elements that we're looking for are there, but the interface is just a little bit different to get started with. Again, one of the things that I actually like about the Windows, uh, the Mac side over here, is the uh, what I, it's called the custom properties or the my properties, and this is something the Windows version doesn't have. So if I go out here and I'm going to select my piece of my uh, dimension over here, and I actually have two toggles across the top of my properties inspector. So I have all, and this is what we're used to seeing, uh, and this is what you'd see on the window side. So I have just this very exhaustive list of all the properties that I have for that particular dimension. But there's only maybe a handful of these that I actually really use on a you know 80 percent, 90 percent of the time. So for that, I get what's called my properties. So with the My Properties, um, it's a condensed list, but it's also a very custom list. So I have an icon right up here, Customize My Properties. When I click that, I can see that exhaustive All Properties, and all I have to do is simply check to see which one of these I want to see in my sort of uh, you know, customized, uh, truncated properties list. So once I've got all the ones selected that I want, click the button again, and there they are. So there's that measurement that I checked, and I can see if there's any dimension overrides or text overrides uh, that were applied to this dimension. So these overrides or this my properties, it's different for every object type. Obviously, different objects have different properties. So if I pick a viewport, I get a different uh, list for my viewport. So you do have to go in to each object type, each kind of geometry, your lines, your circles, dimensions, viewports, and kind of set up the my properties separately for each one of these. But once you do, you get this, again, nice truncated uh, My Properties list, which I find really, really handy to, to use. Now, obviously, these palettes are, you know, they're handy, but they're also, you know, they do take up a little bit of space. And obviously, when I'm working on my iMac like I am today, um, space really isn't that much of a concern. But I also have AutoCAD for Mac running on my 13-inch MacBook uh, Air, in which case I've got a lot less screen real estate to work with. So one of the things that the AutoCAD for Mac team did uh, kind of take advantage of the fact they know that a lot of people have the you know, MacBook Airs and the 13-inch MacBook Pros and the smaller laptop screens, is I have this little option right here. It's called Show Palettes as Icons. Now on the Windows side, we have Clean Screen. The thing with Clean Screen is it wipes everything off the screen, so I only see the drawing area. I don't get my menu bar. I don't get um, my command line or my status bar or any of my toolbars. I don't get anything to really work with. However, Show Palettes as Icons just gets rid of the main palettes. I still have my command line. I still have my status bar, so I can still work. But I can also expand my drawing space to take up a little bit more of the screen. My palettes are now over here on the left side, the left edge of my screen over here. So all I have to do is click on one, and there are all the properties palettes and you know, tool sets and layer palette that I would need to access. And I can click it again, and it gets out of my way. So in my opinion, this is a great way of being able to work on a laptop and maximize your screen real estate, but still be in kind of what I call a working mode. But you can still enter in your commands. You can still access these palettes uh, a little bit differently than clean screen would be. And to get them back, 
I'll just go back up to window and click on show full palettes and they'll come back exactly how I left them. So again, very, very handy. Now when I'm working on my laptop, obviously I'm kind of stuck with the trackpad. I have a mouse, which is fine, uh, but a lot of times you know, I'm portable, that's the whole reason for having my laptop, so I'm stuck with the, the uh, Apple trackpad or the Magic trackpad. So uh, one of the features that I love about using the Magic trackpad um, is actually the ability to really quickly access what's called mission control. Um, the trackpad is typically just three or four fingers straight up on the trackpad. Uh, I'm, and I actually uh, went out and purchased one of the uh, Magic trackpads, uh, the separate ones to use on my desktop. I found this feature so handy. So I'm using a trackpad right now, and all I have to do is take my four fingers, go straight up, and I can immediately see all of the application windows that I have open at any time. So again, I have uh, two different DWG files open right now. All I have to do is select one, and I'm taken right over to that, uh, that drawing. We'll do the same thing over here and grab this one. Now, when I'm in this, it's called Mission Control. You can also notice up here across the very top of the screen, I have what are called different desktops. So these are called spaces. Each one of these spaces is a different desktop that I can use and have different files on. Um, I usually uh, have one space that has all of my communication tools, so my mail, my uh, messages, uh, maybe my Twitter feed or something. I'll have another space, and I can add it just by clicking on the little plus over here. I might have another space with uh, maybe a web browser in it, uh, another one with a PDF for my images that I'm working from, and then, of course, one or two with just AutoCAD. Now, as I'm working in these spaces with AutoCAD, all I have to do is swipe with my, uh, across my trackpad left or right to access the next drawing. All I have to do is click, and now I'm working in this drawing. Swipe right back, and now I'm in this drawing. So it's a really, really quick and easy way of navigating multiple drawings at the same time. Another uh, kind of feature that they use here with the Magic Trackpad, uh, AutoCAD for Mac was the first one to support what's called Pinch to Zoom. Uh, so they actually understand that you know it's a multi-touch trackpad. So the feature here, I'll show you guys exactly what this looks like. So this is the zoom around. It's that same gesture that you would find on your you know tablet or uh, or your phone. Well, we get to do that on the uh, in Auto directly in AutoCAD using the trackpad. So obviously you can't see my fingers, but all I have to do is pinch out or pinch in, and I can zoom in and out of my drawing. I use two fingers, and I can pan around my drawing again, just like I would on my tablet. So it makes for a very, very natural interface. Um, so I find that uh, I've gotten better at it over the years. It does take a little bit of practice if you're used to the, you know, your scroll wheel and such, but again, if you're on a laptop, it's a very, very handy way of navigating around your drawing without feeling like you're you know, kind of lost. I can't tell you how many times I've picked up one of my students, you know, Lenovo computers that they're trying to show me something on, and I've tried to do a pinch to zoom, and I uh, just end up losing the whole drawing. Now, this uh, pinch to zoom here, again, it's based on the zoom factor, and this is a sort of a, a handy little tip if you're not familiar with it. So, the zoom factor is actually a system variable that we can control, and this is just the rate of, uh, the rate of zoom that we're going in and out every time we click our mouse wheel. And this is the same on the Windows side. This isn't just a Mac feature, uh, but again, it's called Zoom Factor. So right now, by default, it's set to 60. So I'm going to change mine to something around, let's say, 35. What this means is, as I pinch and zoom, it's not going to jump in quite as quickly. So it's a little bit slower, but it's a little bit more precise and a little bit more deliberate as well. Um, so you can set this to whatever factor you like, whatever you're comfortable with. And again, just kind of pinch and zoom, and you can navigate around your drawing. So again, my opinion, really took advantage of the Mac hardware to make this version of AutoCAD just, again, a little bit easier to navigate and a little bit easier to work with. Now, again, as I mentioned, we have, you know, uh, we have our drawings that I can open up my mission control to jump back and forth between my drawings, but what we don't have uh, that you might be used to are the drawing tabs that uh, AutoCAD on the Windows side does have. So um, I just don't have anything across the top here that I can quite use to replicate that, so I can't easily uh, click on another file to go back and forth. I can still use my window uh, tool up here in the menu bar and jump back and forth, but I don't have those drawing tabs across the top. To be honest, one of the things I really liked about the drawing tabs when they got released uh, was the open file location. Now, I had a couple of list routines that uh, I had built up over the years, and one of them was specifically for that function. And the idea was, okay, you know, I start out my day, I 
have uh, Explorer in Mac, it's called Finder. I'd be working in Finder, I'd navigate to my, uh, my project directory, wherever it happened to be. I'd start working and then I uh, double click on an AutoCAD file, I'd open it up and then I'd accidentally close out my Finder window. So when I want to go open up another associated drawing, something that's in the same directory, when I go into open, well, it just kind of starts out anywhere, wherever I left off. And obviously the Finder window isn't going to be much help either. But I can go up here on the Mac side. Um, all I have to do right here across the top, you can see the drawing uh, number right here, so drawing number one. If I right click on this, it actually shows me the folder hierarchy. So this is the path to that location. Um, and this is where it's actually a little bit better than the Windows version. I can go back anywhere in that hierarchy to open up a Finder window to whatever level I want. So on the Windows side, it's just open a file location that just goes directly to that same directory where the file is. On this one, I can jump back and forth anywhere in that hierarchy. All I have to do is click, and it opened up over on this side, but it'll open right up to that file location. So again, really, really easy way of uh, jumping back to that. Now, another thing that's useful about this little, uh, these little icons up across the top here is actually opening up files or uh, working with files as well. So, working on a project, I've got my image open here, and I've been, you know, using it. I've been using it as a reference image. I'm kind of, we're going to replicate this uh, little built-in bookshelf over here. So I need to draw it in AutoCAD to get started with it. And uh, you know, it's kind of hard to, to just sit here and draw it and go back and forth and back and forth. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to underlay this into my drawing. So I've got my, uh, my drawing here. I'm going to jump over into model space and I'm going to go ahead and underlay this. So I'm going to do, I'll go up to insert, raster image reference. Now I've got to go find that, uh, that picture. I can't remember quite what directory it is, but I'd have to drill down through my directories to go find that image. Well, on the Mac side, not quite that difficult. So here's my image. All I did was open up Mission Control and I jumped over and looked at my image. There's my uh, image dialog box where it's trying to look for my file. All I have to do is click on the image icon right there. So it's that little icon right to the next of the name. Drag it over onto the uh, dialog box, let it go. And I've jumped all the way right to that image. So now all I have to do is hit open. You can see that's the same image right there, and I can insert it into my drawing. This works all across the Mac operating system. It's not just something for AutoCAD, uh, but again, it's one of the things I really like about the Mac operating system. I can jump back and forth, and it allows me to do little things like that, dragging and dropping my locations. So quite handy. Now again, I said that, you know, the interface is fairly similar. We have uh, the same dynamic input uh, features that we would have on the Windows side as well. And I want to show you guys a little tip. This is something that I discovered literally just a few weeks ago in class when I was helping out one of my students. So in the offset command, uh, I'll start the command, I'll enter in my value, and I'll start the command, I'll grab my side, and I'll go ahead and pick my side. And the thing that we kind of noticed was using dynamic input, the value of the offset is actually highlighted. So right here, right in the middle of the, uh, the that numerical value is highlighted. That means I can type something else in as I'm using the offset command. So maybe I have a series of, you know, 0.75. Again, I use the offset command for measuring quite a bit. But now I need to enter in another value. Instead of getting out of the command, entering the value, going back and picking the same object, all I have to do is type in another value and press return. I'm still in the offset command, and I'm still at that default 0.75 value. But again, now I can really easily grab it and then type in another value and hit return. So this was something, again, I discovered not too long ago, and it works the same on Windows as it does on the Mac side. So no difference there, but it is a handy little, uh, little trick that I found. Now, the only thing I never really liked about dynamic input when it first came out, and it's one of the things that I had my students actually usually turn it on for the first few weeks of class, is that every entry that you enter in is considered relative. It's always relative to the last point. Um, and I found this rather disconcerting as I was trying to teach them, you know, Cartesian planes and all this other stuff. I didn't want them to get confused. And I didn't realize that it's something that you can actually change. So if I go to... Uh, Tools, and I'm going to go to Drafting Settings, and I'm going to go over here to Dynamic Input. 
And right here under pointer input, I click on settings. So I can choose which format I want. If I want it to always come up in polar or Cartesian, if I'm using Cartesian plane uh, or Cartesian stuff, or right here I have relative or absolute. So if I'm looking for absolute, I can click this and it'll default to absolute. And then I'll just have to type in the at symbol anytime I want to do relative. Um, so I thought this was rather interesting and it was kind of buried in here that I, you know, using this for a number of years and I never really knew it was there. Uh, another way of uh, doing this or temporarily overriding this, so mine's set to relative, so I'll pick my first point and I'm going to go ahead and say, you know, at 1 comma 1 and it'll draw my line. If I want to enter in an absolute point, all I have to do, instead of typing in the at symbol, I type in the hash mark the hashtag or the pound sign, uh, shift three, then I can enter in the exact uh, Cartesian coordinate or the absolute coordinate. So if I type in zero comma zero, it's going to draw that line all the way back down here to the origin point. So just again, type in, uh, just like you would the at symbol when you want to do a relative, type in the hash mark and then your value, you get an absolute coordinate system instead. Again, works the same way, Mac or Windows, doesn't matter. Now, as I was working in the, uh, I'm going to switch over here to my other drawing. So one of the things I, uh, in preparation for this, I kind of went into the uh, AutoCAD for Mac forums on the Autodesk forums and was looking around at all the different questions that people were having and so forth. And one of the big questions or the issues that people have seems to center around plotting. The plot uh, system on Mac is similar, but just a little bit different than the Windows version. It's, not dramatically different. Personally, I find that the plotting system on the Windows is you know, kind of a debacle as it is, uh, but the Mac side just unfortunately doesn't really help that along. So my biggest recommendation when you're working on the Mac side is use your page setups and use them often. Uh, the Mac side uses page setups just like you do on the Windows side, but I find myself not using them quite as often as I do on the Windows side because I can kind of get around them. On the Mac side, it's a little bit more needed. So I'm going to go up here to File and Print, and get into my print window here, and obviously this is the default Mac uh, window. So I've got my AutoCAD uh, kind of drop down right here. I have just one or two of the normal settings that we're used to, what to print, there's you know, extents, layout, window, and so forth, and I can choose my scale and maybe scale my line weights, and that's all I can control from this default view. If I want to get into anything else, I have to go here to Edit Page Setup. Now it's a little bit more familiar from the uh, AutoCAD side. I can choose my page setup. I can change my printer if I like, choose my paper size, extents, my scale, um, offset, center it, my plot style, and everything else that I'm used to being able to set on the window side. But there is one icon that's down here that's missing, and that's apply to layout. So any of these changes that I make is only going to be for this print. It's not going to, there's no way to save this back to the page setup as a uh, as another page set up, so a little disappointing. But again, I can click up here and I can access any of the default page setups that I'm used to. Now, the other question that a lot of people uh, concerned that people have as well, on the Windows side, we have virtual printers. So I have, you know, uh, DWG to PDF, I, the newer ones, you know, AutoCAD General or PDF General, um, high documentation, you know, high level, high quality and so forth. Um, and these are all virtual printers that allow me to print to page sizes that I don't necessarily have available to me on my local printer. So I've got a little brother printer over here, and it does 11 by 17 great, but I can't do anything bigger. And obviously this page, I need to be able to print something 24 by 36. Well, that's not one of my options that I have here. So to do this, I have to go into Manage Custom Sizes. And essentially, all I'm going to do is I'm going to call this 24 by 36. Nothing overly creative there. So 36 inches wide, 24 inches tall. Uh, for the um, principal area, I'm just going to use zero for all of my margins here just to make my life a little bit easier. And I'm going to go ahead and say OK. So now I get my 24 by 36 uh, paper size. So this is the only way of printing to paper sizes that are not supported by your printer. Go ahead and click OK. And again, I'm using extents. Now the other thing that we have here, we have our preview option down here which I can use. If I click preview, it creates a little PDF preview for me. I'm going to go ahead and change this to fit to paper so we can actually see what we're working with here. 
But I also have down here, I can save directly to a PDF. So again, I don't have a virtual PDF printer, but PDF is built into the Mac operating system. So all I have to do is go down here, and there's open PDF in preview, save as a pre, uh, PDF, or I can even go directly into a mail message, and it'll open up my mail application, and attach my PDF, you can see it attached right there, right into a new mail message for me. So saving a step, I don't even have to save it, then go attach it or anything like that. So very clean way of doing things. Now, another tip that I usually give uh, anyone, sort of my newer uh, AutoCAD users or mostly my students, is all, uh, editing the command aliases. This is something we do on the Windows side. It's a little bit different on the Mac side, but I think it's actually a little bit easier. So up under Tools, we have Customize, and right there I have Edit Command Aliases. All this does, when I click on it, it opens it up in Text Edit, and there's all of our standard uh, command aliases, and if you're not familiar, these are all the shortcut keys that you would type in, so T for text and uh, C for circle and so forth, uh, that we're used to editing in. And this list is editable, uh, but the first thing I usually tell my students is, don't edit anything that you see up here. I actually want to go all the way down to the very bottom of this screen. We have a special uh, space down here at the very bottom, and it says, you know, user-defined command aliases. So back when I started using AutoCAD, my instructor told me AutoCAD's a very uh, simple program. It only remembers the last thing that you told it. So if I tell it that C stands for circle, and then two minutes later I tell it C stands for something like copy, it's only going to remember that C stands for copy. So that means I can put all of my command aliases down here at the bottom, and they'll override anything that came before it. So I have my series of command aliases here. Again, I use copy a lot more than I use circle, but I also want to be able to you know, type in a letter or two and draw a circle as well. So you notice instead of using something like CI, instead of tip hitting two different keys, I tend to hit the same key twice. I find it a little bit faster. So CC for circle, DD for divide, D for distance. I have M for move and then MM for mirror and so forth. Uh, S for stretch and SS for scale. If I'm T again, hitting the same key twice is a lot faster than hitting different keys. So when I'm all done my uh, text editing, save my PGP file, I'll save it out, and then back here under Customize, I have to reload those command aliases. Uh, otherwise, I have to restart AutoCAD in order for any of those to take effect. Now, speaking of uh, function keys and shortcut keys, obviously across the top of your Mac keyboard, if you're familiar, we have all the function keys, but the function part, the F9, F10, they're all written kind of small, and they're really taken over by these media keys or these special function keys, things like you know, changing the volume of your speakers, changing the screen uh, brightness, and so forth. And the only way to, act to get these to kind of revert back and use the regular function keys that we obviously use tons in AutoCAD, F3 for object snap, F8 for ortho mode, is you have to find the FN key. So it stands for function. Uh, on the uh, smaller keyboards and especially on the laptops, it's usually found in the lower left corner. Personally, I find this kind of annoying that I have to jump back and forth and back and forth and changing these, because I do use the media keys quite often, um, but there is a way of changing it kind of on a permanent basis. So if I go into system preferences, and go out here to keyboard, Right here, I have the option, use all F1, F2 standard as standard function keys. So right now, I have this checked. If I uncheck it, I go back into AutoCAD. So now if I hit F3, or sorry, I'll hit uh, F10 here. Now I'm muting my computer rather than turning on my polar. And I can do the reverse as well. So if I set these to my standard function keys, I can hold down the function key and get the media keys back. And that's all well and good, but I found myself switching these back and forth and back and forth, and I just found it annoying to have to remember to go back and do it. So what I resolved myself to do, being the Apple geek that I am, is I came up with my own little application. So this is my keyboard FN key switch. So what this does, when I click on it, I get a quick flash of my screen, and it actually switches from one to the other for me. So this is done using Apple Script, and I've, this is the code that allows me to do that. It's nothing overly complex, so there's uh, you know, nothing to worry about really here. All it says is go into System Preferences, go to the Keyboard pane, uh, tell the third, you know, this ch uh, specific checkbox to turn itself on, and then quit System Preferences. So I'll make this, this is available on my website, and I'll make this available in the, uh, in the presentation notes as well if you guys want to copy and use this. So once you 
you know, copy and paste this into your Apple script, say file, export, and then I can export this out directly as an application. So I'm going to put this out on my desktop and I'll click save. And you can see it pop up right over here. Now the only thing with uh, Apple, they want to make sure that you're very careful with everything. So if I try and act, use this right now, we'll see this. It's not allowed assistive access, which is all well and good. All I have to do is click on, uh, is actually go up and open up my system preferences. So on your system preferences, go up here to security and privacy. And under accessibility, all I have to do is tell, uh, tell the Apple operating system that this is a safe app to run. Uh, that it's okay to use. So enter my password, I'll click on the little plus button here, I'll add this to my list. So now all I have to do, I'll uh, it's my easy way of uh, grabbing this, I'm just going to swipe over here and double click and it altered my function keys for me. So again, I put mine down in my dock here so it's always available, but it's a really easy way of just switching those keys back and forth. Now, speaking of, uh, again, while we're on the topic of function keys and, the, uh, and this other stuff, I want to talk a little bit about cut, copy, and paste. So obviously, on the Windows side, we have Control X, Control C, Control V for cut, copy, and paste. On the Mac side, we use the command key for those functions as well. Uh, if you're ever forgetful, it's all the phrase that I learned was lose control to gain command. So command X, command C, and command V all work the same way. Um, so if I want to copy some of this geometry into another drawing, I'll grab it, I'll do command C, I'll swap over to my other drawing, and then command V, and I can paste it in. But it's always giving the standard, you know, copy command always gives me the lower left corner, the origin point of my geometry, which isn't quite what I want. I need a point somewhere else out here in the middle. So what I'm going to do is select my objects. If we look up here under edit, this actually shows me all of the shortcut keys that I would need to perform any of these actions. So there's, you know, command X, command C, and then I have copy with a base point. So this is shift command C. So let's see how that works. I've got my objects selected here. I'm going to do Command, Shift, and C, and it asks me for my base point. I'll go ahead and pick the center point right about there. Jump over to my other drawing and paste right off of my base point. So this makes life a lot easier uh, just using the little shortcut key. So again, if you're ever not sure what a shortcut key is or you're looking for one, just go up here to the menu bar and look right over here to the right and you'll find the shortcut key for that specific uh, tool or command. So I have just one or two more quick little uh, tips here. And again, um, the control, the copy with the base point works on the window side as well. You just do the control shift and C or control shift and X and it'll do the base point command as well. So again, most of these, not just uh, Mac, they work pretty much the same way no matter what operating system you're on. So I want to talk a really quickly about text here. Uh, I was obviously taught uh, architectural plans. Typically, we want to make sure that uh, all of our room tags, every room has to have a tag, so we, and we enclose these in a rectangle. Now, I mentioned before that we got a lot of the Express tools in the last version, and they're here up under Tools. Express tools, so we've got you know, convert text to M text, break line symbols, moco row, move copy rotate, uh, super hatch, and all these other great features. But what we didn't get was uh, T circle or enclosed text with an object. This is one that I've been pining for for quite a quite a long time. The reason being, well, I've got my text here, and I can draw a rectangle around it and kind of eyeball it. But obviously, this is AutoCAD. I'm not. I don't like being that uh, general. So this is just a piece of D text, and all I did was take a rectangle and kind of drew it around it. Um, then I would have to move this into the center of the rectangle, and if I needed to edit this text in any way, uh, maybe I want to turn this into a formal dining room. Well, now I have to move my box, stretch it, and everything. It's not associated with it the same way it is with uh, T-Circle. Now, another option that I have is using M-Text. So I'm going to go up here under Annotation. And if we use M text, I'm going to draw my little window here, and I'm just going to type in kitchen. And when I select this over here in the properties, I've got all my properties here. We have this option down here. It's called text frame. 
The only thing I don't like about this is it gives me the text frame around the entire M text object, not just the text. So it does update itself if I go into the, uh, the text object here. Zoom out. Oh, I jumped into model space here. So let me, if I grab that and I add something, it makes itself bigger, but again, it's all based on the size of the M text box. So again, that's not quite what I want. I don't want to have to you know, come back in and, and mess with this stuff. And it doesn't quite work the way I want it to. So uh, this is a tip I picked up from uh, Jeannie Arhus. Uh, she was at Autodesk University a couple weeks ago, and this was one that I was not aware of that I found rather handy. And that's um, the trick is to create a multi-leader style that doesn't have a leader. So up under Format, I'm going to go into my multi-leader style, and I'm going to create a new one. I'm just going to call it cop I'll call it a box text here for the moment. And under the leader format, instead of straight or spline, I'm just going to choose none. And then under content, I'm going to click right here where it says frame text. I'll click OK. Make sure that that's my current and click close. So now I'll go grab my M text. I'm going to create my same M text box just like I usually would with the leader. I'll type in my, uh, my text and click save. But notice the frame is just around my text. So even though the M text box is way out here, the frame stays just around the text that I have uh, in here. So if I need to add another line, let's say, to Car Garage, it updates itself automatically for me. So I wasn't aware of this, and it's a great way to kind of get around that enclosing text with an object uh, command. Uh, so again, handy little tool, and it works the same way again on the Windows side. Another uh, interesting M text feature that I have, if I select my, I'm going to get in here to edit my M text here. We have all of these options to edit our M text, you know, uh, I call this my mini word um, where I can do all this formatting. I've got the uh, rulers here. I can enter in symbols and uh, fields and so forth. But I can also control the paragraphing settings on this text as well. And these are hidden kind of over here. I'm going to go right up to the top right corner of my M text box. I'm going to right click. Here, I can go into Paragraph, and now I have all the same paragraph settings that I would have in a program, a word processor like Word. I can indent just the first line or the uh, hanging. I can specify a, a value. I can adjust the paragraph alignment or paragraph spacing if I want to leave more space, maybe let's say after my notes. Um, I want to add a little bit more spacing after each one of my bullet notes. All I have to do is check that and add that value in here. I can also adjust the overall line spacing as well. So again, this is kind of hidden, but when I found it, I was rather, uh, kind of rather pleased with myself that I could get in and edit things uh, quite to that level. So those are just a couple of uh, quick uh, little tips and tricks, and again, most of those work on the Windows side the same way they do on the Mac side. Um, so just kind of, again, driving home that little uh, fact there that the, Win the Mac version is really just as capable as the Windows version for about 90% of the users that I run into. So if you haven't uh, played with it yet, I definitely recommend getting back in and playing with it. Um, so if you want to, uh, so just a real quick wrap up, obviously talked about custom properties, we did the palettes as icons, uh, the cool uh, trackpad features, we talked about path, uh, being able to drag your file path anywhere that you want, a couple of tips for the dynamic input, uh, being able to plot to custom paper sizes, again, make sure you're using your page setups uh, liberally, uh, adding your, your program parameters or your command aliases. I'll have that uh, little app there that everybody can use to switch your function keys back and forth. Um, and then we had some uh, cool little text objects as well. So I'm always available if anybody needs a hand with AutoCAD for Mac. Uh, you can email me, follow my Twitter feed for tips and tricks and things like that. Um, so all that information will be up there in the presentation. But obviously, if you want to click, these uh, will be in there as well. So if you want an uh, AutoCAD for Mac free trial, or you can go right to the AutoCAD for Mac help website, or the Autodesk forums, uh, they have a special section just for AutoCAD for Mac. 
Um, I'm in there, but not quite as often as some of the other users. I know Max and Kay is a, another expert elite who spends a lot of time in the AutoCAD for Mac forums, and he's incredibly knowledgeable, um, and he answers a lot, a lot of questions on there, so he's definitely one to ask for. Um, but again, go to the Autodesk forums, ask questions, and also make feature requests. If there's something that is keeping you from the AutoCAD for Mac side, talk about it in the forums. Uh, find out how, you know, maybe you'll start a conversation, maybe other people are looking for that same command or that same ability, maybe somebody else has a workaround, uh, or maybe the Auto, uh, AutoCAD for Mac team will read it and add it into the next version. So I think that's everything that I have. Uh, I'm gonna, um, I'll go to this next one and I'll throw it back uh, over to my moderators here. Thank you so much, Jim. That was that was really great. Thank you. Uh, let me go ahead and take control here. And so, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Jim, for um, for that really great presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions for Jim or or for the Mac, um, please ask them now. We do have um, a few minutes for some Q and A. I don't see any questions right now um, specific to Mac, but if you do have them, um, please feel free to ask us, and we'll take some time to. Um, go over those with you. Um, and again, thank you for joining us. If you have um, any questions or any feedback at all, please let us know. We're happy to, um, to hear your ideas and any suggestions that you might have for, um, for future webinars. Um, and we do have, we'll give some people a few minutes to get in any last minute questions there. And in the meantime, um, I will go ahead and ask our final poll for today. And that is, um, did you learn something new in today's session? And we'll leave that open for a few seconds here. And that's absolutely wonderful, Jim. So 100% of the attendees said that they learned something um, new today. And I'll go ahead and share those results real quick with you. All right. And Dave, I'm not seeing that we have any new questions. Do you have any that I might have missed here? Uh, well, there's one that just uh, came in about the quote quote ribbon which you know the little um, trays on the, on the left hand side to asking if there's a way to add uh, or show both the annotative and the drafting options at the same time. Fortunately there's not at the moment. So just one of the three uh, drafting uh, annotation or the modeling one so it's unfortunately only one at a time. However you can go in, they do have a CUI editor, so you can go in and create your own tool sets uh, that will show up under that list, and you can add in your own panels um, and your own commands to kind of customize that. So, you, uh, you know, you find yourself switching back and forth, you can kind of combine them and get all the commands that you want and make your own kind of custom one. Yeah. And uh, I'll also just uh, put in a little plug here for, uh, for um, one of the uh, January uh, webinars that we plan on doing a, uh, a webinar for what's new in the next release of AutoCAD for Mac. So if you're a Mac user, please you know, stay tuned for that one and Jim will be back with us to cover that. But uh, not seeing any other questions at the moment. All right, so thanks everyone for, for taking the time to join us today, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next AutoCAD webinar, which is on December 15th, our last one of 2016, and uh, we wish everyone a wonderful holiday. <laughs>